In fairly good season, we encamped that night on the plain at the top of the saddle, in two days from the snow line, a feat which I had previously hoped with Swiss guides to be able to accomplish. The exceptionally cold day, the coldest I had experienced in my six efforts on this mountain, was followed by a high wind. Had I expected to make the attempt on this day, I should have insisted upon an earlier start. Both guides, however, though not anxious to set out early, were in favor of going, asserting that we might find less wind higher up, if not, that we could turn back. On the contrary, unless the wind died down altogether, it was more likely to be worse above. And it was against my better judgment that I yielded to their wishes. At the late hour for such a climb of eight o'clock, we set forth, myself and the two guides only. For the cold ascent, I was wearing every stitch of clothing that I had brought. Three suits of lightweight woolen underwear, two pairs of tights, canvas knickerbockers, two flannel waists, a little cardigan jacket, two sweaters, and four pairs of woolen stockings. But as most of the clothing was porous, it was inadequate to keep out wind, for which I had relied upon the Eskimo suit, now at the bottom of a crevice. I had not really needed it before, nor worn it except at night. Now, when I wanted it badly, it was gone. I am often asked if my progress is not impeded by the weight of so much clothing, to which I answer no. All of the articles were light, and garments which cling closely to the body are not burdensome. I never noticed the weight at all. A skirt, on the contrary, however short and light, anything depending from the waist or shoulders, is some hindrance to movement and of noticeable weight. I had not an ounce of strength to spare for superfluities, nor do I consider that an abbreviated skirt would add to the gracefulness of my appearance, or, if it did, that this upon the mountain would be of the slightest consequence, while in rock climbing the shortest skirt may be an added source of danger. I had repeatedly warned the men of the great danger of freezing above, not so much from the actual cold as from the rarity of the air telling them how Pelissier, one of Conway's guides, with two pairs of stockings, had had his feet frozen on Aconcagua so that they turned black and he barely escaped losing them. How Zurbrigan, Mackinaz, and others had been frostbitten on Aconcagua and Serrata. In spite of this, they hardly seemed to realize the necessity of so much care. The men carried food and tea for luncheon, the hypsometer to take observations, and my camera. The mercurial barometer I had left in Yunge from the misgivings that I might have to carry it if it were brought along. As there was no extra clothing of mine to transport since I had put it all on, I ventured to ask if one of the guides could carry up the warm poncho, fearing that I might need it when we paused for luncheon or on the summit. It was rather heavy and a considerable burden at that altitude, but Gabriel said that he could take it. To the fact of my extreme, apparently superfluous caution, and of Gabriel's willingness and strength, I certainly owe the possession and soundness of all my limbs, as I also owe Gabriel my life. Coming out at length upon a ridge where we were most exposed to the wind, I felt the need for my vicuna mittens, which had seemed too warm below. I delayed asking for a while, hoping to come to a better standing place, but as none appeared, calling a halt I approached Rudolph, who continually held the rope for me, while Gabriel was cutting the steps, so that the delays necessary on the previous ascent were avoided. Rudolph, taking the mittens from his rucksack with some black woven sleeves I had earlier worn on my forearms, tucked the former under one arm, saying, "'Which will you have first? I had it on the end of my tongue to exclaim, "'Look out, you don't lose my mittens!' But like most men, the guides were rather impatient of what they considered unnecessary advice, or suggestions from a woman, even an employer. So thinking he surely will be careful of my mittens, I refrained and said, Give me the omelets. A second later, Rudolph cried, I've lost one of your mittens. I did not see it go. It slipped out of the back. But anything dropped on that smooth slope, even without the high wind, might as well have gone over a precipice. I was angry and alarmed at his inexcusable carelessness. But it was useless to talk. I could do that after we got down, though under subsequent circumstances, I never did. 
I hastily put my two brown mittens and one red mitt on my left hand, the vicuna fur on my right, which generally held the ice axe and was therefore more exposed. Onward and upward for hours we pressed. When at length we paused for luncheon, being too cold and too tired to eat the meat which had frozen in the rucksack and the almost equally hard bread, about two o'clock Rudolph declared himself unable to proceed. I was for leaving him there and going on with Gabriel, but the latter urged him onward, suggesting that by leaving his rucksack he might be able to continue with us. This, after a short rest, he did, finding that we were going on anyway. The latter part of the climb was especially steep. All suffering from cold and fatigue required frequent brief halts. At last we were approaching our goal. On the ridge the wind was stronger than ever, and I suddenly realized that my left hand was insensible and freezing. Twitching off my mittens, I found that the hand was nearly black. Rubbing it vigorously with snow, I soon had it aching badly, which signified its restoration. But it would surely freeze again in the colder hours of the late afternoon and night. My overcaution in having the poncho brought up now proved my salvation. This heavy shawl or blanket with a slit in the middle slipped over my head, kept me fairly warm in the end, protecting my hands somewhat, as well as my whole body. At the same time, it was awkward to wear, reaching nearly my knees, and was the cause of my slipping, and almost of my death on the way down. But for the loss of my fur mitten, I should not have been compelled to wear it, except, as intended, on the summit. A little further on, Gabriel suggested our halting for the observations, as the wind might be worse at the extremity of the ridge. Rudolph now untied and disappeared. I was so busy over the hypsometer that I did not notice where he went, realizing only that he was not there. While careful not to expose too much of my left hand, I shielded the hypsometer from the wind as well as I was able with the poncho. Gabriel struck match after match in vain. Once he lighted the candle, but it went out immediately. After striking twenty matches, Gabriel said, It is useless, we must give it up. With Rudolph's assistance in holding the poncho, we might have done better. The dread descent was before us. Sadly, I packed away the instrument, believing it better to return alive, if possible, than to risk further delay. It was a great disappointment not to make the expected contribution to science, perhaps to have broken the world's record, but without being able to prove it but to return alive seemed still more desirable, even though in the ignorance of the exact height to which we had attained. Rudolph now appeared and informed me that he had been on the summit, instead of remaining to assist with the hypsometer. I was enraged. I had told them long before that as it was my expedition, I should like, as is customary, to be the first one to place my foot at the top, even though I reached it through their instrumentality. It would not lessen their honour, and I was paying the bills. Oh, the disappointment may have been trivial. Of course it made no real difference to the honour to which I was entitled, but of a certain personal satisfaction, long looked forward to. I felt I had been robbed. Once more I resolved, if ever we got down again, to give that man a piece of my mind, a large one. But after all, I never did, for then he had troubles enough of his own, and words would not change the fact. Now, without a word, I went on. Though the grade was slight, I was obliged to pause several times in the fierce wind, once leaning my head on my ice axe for a few seconds before I could continue to the goal. Gabriel stopped a short distance from the end, advising me not to go too near the edge, which I had no inclination to do, passing but a few feet beyond him. I should like to have looked down into the Langanuco Gorge, whence I had looked up the cliff and the thick overhanging cornice, such as impended above the east and west cliffs also. Had it been earlier in the day, being particularly fond of precipices, and this would have been the biggest I had ever looked down, I should have ventured near the north edge with Gabriel holding the rope. But now I did not care to hazard delay from the possibility of breaking through the cornice. My first thought on reaching the goal was, I am here at last after all these years. 
but shall we ever get down again? I said nothing except, give me the camera, and as rapidly as possible took views towards the four quarters of the heavens, one including Gabriel. The click of the camera did not sound just right, and fearing that I was getting no pictures at all, I did not bother to have Gabriel to try to take a photograph of me. This I afterwards regretted, as I should like to have preserved such a picture for my own pleasure. But in later days I was thankful indeed that in spite of the high wind and blowing snow, the other pictures did come out fairly. For it is pictures from the summit that tell the tale, and not the picture of someone standing on a bit of rock or snow which may be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs>